Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Ehan Isaacs. I'm the head of global growth for the Founder Institute. Super excited to be hosting today's webinar uh, on seven reasons why corporate innovation fails. We have uh, Ingeborg with us. Uh, for those who don't know, she's our co-director for FI Switzerland, and she also has a very extensive background. I'll let her self-introduce herself uh, in a shortly, uh, but she comes from a, the corporate innovation world and is very well experienced. And I'm really, really happy, you know, that she's taking the time out. Uh, to give us our presentation today. Uh, before, we're going to start in about 30 seconds there. Before we do that, I just want to go over some housekeeping. Um, you, you can see uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a chat. Please throw in the chat. Let us know where you're coming in from. I'm seeing Tel Aviv, New York, Alberta, uh, South Africa. I'm based in Toronto right now. Ingeborg's in Geneva or? Zurich. Zurich. I, I feel like I was close. Okay, in Zurich. We have Argentina, London, so uh, nice. And we had about 200 people sign up. We're already at 55 people, so not bad. Uh, really looking forward um, to, to speaking to everyone. So uh, please, the chat, use it to communicate with everyone. If you do have a question towards the end, please use the Q&A section. It's right underneath the chat. The reason is you can go and see what other people are uh, asking, upload it, and then we can bring it up on screen uh, later on. So in terms of an agenda, uh, you know, Engelboard will do about a presentation for about maybe I'll say 20 to 30 minutes. After that, we'll jump into Q&A. We'll leave the last 10 minutes or so for open networking. So that way everyone can get to know each other. Um, with that being said, oh, the last most important, there's some emojis at the bottom of your screen. If um, you think what Engelboard is saying is good, valuable, insightful, please show uh, those reactions. That's the only way we know that's the feed the real-time feedback we got from the audience okay Ingeborg, we haven't even started and you're getting thumbs up and hearts and all of that stuff so well, maybe cool. you're getting them mayhem <laughs> i am good all right i'm gonna stay quiet Ingeborg. i'll let you self-introduce yourself you know take us away i'm really really excited this is a very important topic i'm sure a lot of the audience wants to learn more about you and your extensive experience um yeah, just whenever you're ready, feel free to share your screen and, and kick things off. I'll jump back on in about 20 minutes or 30 to, to do questions. All right. And I'll be in the chat if, if anybody wants to uh, throw anything in there. I'll, I'll, I'll be responding to it as well. All right. Ingeborg, you good? Yeah, cool. Thank you. And can you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Whenever you're ready. I'll get started. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Ingeborg. And um, like I had said, I will be talking about uh, corporate innovation. I'll be introducing myself in, uh, I think, on slide three or something. But uh, before that, uh, I just wanted to say that if you are actually calling in as a corporate innovator, this may hurt a little. Uh, it's a pain that I have experienced myself. Uh, what we will cover today is, like I said, introducing myself very briefly, hopefully, and then understanding the stumbling blocks for corporate innovation, right? Like not just what they are, but where they come from and how to recognize them. I hope I can cover that in 25 to 30 minutes. Well, let's hope that. I will give a quick preview of all the other stuff I'll cover in the bootcamp that I had mentioned, because there isn't that much use in, you know, sharing with you the stumbling blocks and where they come from and how to recognize them if I don't also tell you uh, in the bigger format of the bootcamp um, what you can do about it or what, in my experience, can be done about it for corporate innovation. And then there will be time for Q&A. So as a quick intro, and you don't have to read all this text, right? Today, I'm serving as a board member and an advisory board member, both in larger, older companies, and in very young, very small companies, commonly known as startups. I also work as a, as a senior innovation advisor, and I'm a director of Founder Institute Switzerland. But the reason I could talk about corporate innovation and the pitfalls and the stumbling blocks and the success factors for hours is because before that, I was uh, 26 years in, um, you know, the companies that became Jakob Sichard, Kraft Foods and Mondelez International. And I specialized on innovation quite early on. So I had 13 years of leading regional and global innovation roles, and I learned a lot. And, you know, 
uh, the last act basically in in my corporate world and my corporate career was as a global VP of innovation to design an incubation and venturing unit, which is kind of where where the world of corporate and startup um, began to touch each other. And uh, the logos of the companies below are those that I have worked with, am working with uh, partly. Who knows? Maybe the one or the other person in the audience will recognize their own company logo if you're fast enough. Just to say that, um, yes, my 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 own experience, my basically in corporate experience, was mainly in food and consumer goods. But ever since, I've had the privilege to work with companies from all walks of life, really. B2B, B2C, food and non-food. There is, of course, a skew towards food in here because that's what I love doing. But also other consumer goods and, and like I said, B2B. So that kind of that experience has confirmed to me that we're all struggling with the same problems in corporate innovation. And the thing is that, you know, for 13 years, while I was wondering, why is it so hard and examining what I could do to make it work? Um, I was kind of, you know, it was really hard. And once I was outside, I could see suddenly a lot of things that from the inside, simply I could not. And that's because we really don't see what we are in while we're in it. There is, there is, it's a cognitive phenomenon, right? Like we take things as a given that are in fact optional, but we cannot see that. They are optional and they can be questioned, but we don't know that while we're in them. And some of those things that, that, we take as a given some of the things that we don't even know are there are real stumbling blocks to innovation in big companies and those stumbling blocks are those that i want to focus on today you know in the shortness of time um you could say there are probably 10 but i found these to be the most common the most common seven stumbling blocks that we're not asking the right questions I'll, I'll expand on all of these, of course. Um, and maybe I should go right into it, but just very briefly, we know too much. We find it very hard to let go. We're always on the lookout for fewer, bigger, better innovations. Um, we allow our core operations to kill off our innovations, and I'll tell you how and why. We automatically think of innovation as something additional, especially when you're in the in the space of physical products. If it's tech, sometimes that's different, but I, I see it happen a lot. And we use the wrong set of KPIs, which uh, is quite a serious one. So let's let's dive right into it, into those stumbling blocks. We're not asking the right questions. So, you know, I I I often get asked to help companies with innovation and my first question to them is, why do you innovate? Why do you want to innovate? And basically, if innovation is the answer, what was the question? And it's as unlikely as it sounds. These are the answers I get. And if you work in corporate innovation and you can hear me right now, maybe ask yourself if this would have been your answer. So answers I hear a lot. We innovate, we invest in innovation to accelerate growth, right? Or to drive gross margin accretion. Or we need to remain competitive in a dynamic market. Or even more precise, we need 20% of our growth to come from innovation so we can achieve our plan. Or because analysts or shareholders or other stakeholders expect an innovation rate of above 12%. Fill in your number, right? Mine was 12. Or we want to innovate because it's good for corporate culture and employer attractiveness. Or because the world is changing, is changing, and we need to remain on top of it. These are all true. Most of them are probably true. 
But, you know, just because it's true, that does not make it a good innovation strategy. And if you don't know why you're innovating in the first place, what, what question you're trying to answer, that's not a great starting point and a real stumbling block in all phases of innovation. So, you know, better would be answers like we invest in innovation because our core business will shrink in the long run or because, you know, the tech development is shifting our route to market or AI will eliminate the need for our services or because our current portfolio no longer serves the needs of a new generation or because the supply or the supply chain of key ingredients or components is problematic or collapsing or because our business endangers the health and safety of people or the future of our planet, which I hope it doesn't. But that might be actually a viable question that innovation needs to answer. Or because there will not be sufficient talent and workforce in the near future, so we can't continue the way we are doing today. You know, the big difference between the first page and this page is that all of the reasons to innovate on the first page were internally focused and all of the reasons here are externally focused. So that, that makes them actual problems that somebody cares about because nobody cares about whether your business will achieve its growth goals. Only you, only you care about that, right? But you're, if you're in business, it means that you want somebody to pay. And that means that you have to solve somebody else's problem, not your own. So successful innovation does require a razor sharp problem statement. And if you work in an innovation team, in a company innovation team, you know, the discipline of sharp problem statements can be learned. It can be taught. And I always, advise innovation teams to not start working without a razor sharp problem statement. They need a clear brief. Otherwise, you know, it will fail. The second stumbling block is that we know too much. We are like this lovely elephant, like huge, you know, a huge corporation, probably a nice corporation. Elephants are nice. But elephants also have very, very large memories, long memories, right? And all of those things that we know that will, they will stop us from successfully innovating. That didn't work last time, of course, has to be everybody's favorite, right? The, law, the more experience you have, the more you know that, ah, that won't work. But, you know, the user is not willing to pay the premium. For how many decades have we heard that about environmental friendly innovation or more sustainable innovation? or no provider in this space is profitable. That's what you constantly hear about, for example, food delivery services, which basically means we shouldn't do it because no provider in this space is profitable, right? It's just a killer statement. The customer does not accept that, or it's not what our trend study says, or it's not a good fit with the brands, or there are insurmountable technical hurdles. Has to be one of my favorites, the technical hurdles, because that landscape is shifting all the time. I remember the discussion about see-through packaging. Like, people want to see what they're buying, so they want see-through packaging. But that is an insurmountable technical hurdle because if the human eye can go through, light can go through. So light could damage the product, so we can't do it. People want it, but we can't do it. And then what happened? Kind Bar did it and the light did not damage the kind bar. So these things are all true, all the things you know until somebody just goes and does it. So we need to unlearn what we think we know. The things that we have learned are only valid until somebody goes and proves them wrong. And that should be us if we work in corporate innovation, not somebody else, right? Stumbling block three is that we just find it so hard to let go. Um, this pick, you know, I use this a lot. You know the fable of the lion and the mouse, right? So um, um, lion catches mouse. Mouse says, oh, please, please let me go. I'll do you a favor next time. 
And the lion says, yeah, like you can do me a favor, right? And uh, lion falls into trap and mouse comes and kind of chews his whatever stuff off that keeps him trapped. So the little mouse can do something that the big lion cannot. And that's really uh, my whole point here. Um, different companies, different people, different entities are good at different things. And we find that so hard to accept and it becomes a stumbling block because collaboration is often more effective than competition. And getting help, the ability to go get help is an art. And it's a, a very important survival skill. It will get you to the finish line a lot faster than if you think you have to learn everything yourself. We are obsessed with stuff like, what are others better at? Why does that have to be a problem? Do things only ever turn out well if we do them ourselves? We seem to believe that, right? Because whenever the world around us changes and new skills are required to be successful in that changing world, um, our instinctive reaction, our default reaction is, oh, we need to get better at this. You know, we need to get better at this. Let's make this our signature capability of the future. Like agile was one of those. But it's so much easier and so much faster and so much more successful to instead find a mouse and not learn how to chew through your own trap straps or whatever they are called. So what makes a good collaborator, you know, if you're not a good collaborator, nobody will want to collaborate with you. Uh, but I can't cover that here. Uh, that's for the boot camp. Um, I think it's an, maybe the most important skill to learn. So instead of learning all of those new skills, you learn the skill of collaboration and bring in skills by doing that, multiple skills. Um, stumbling block number four is that we have an obsession usually in corporate innovation with fewer, bigger, better. The metaphors we use are all about rocket launch. I mean, why does a product launch even, why do we call that a product launch? Because of the rocket launch. That's where this comes from, right? Um, and I could give you many more examples. All, all of our metaphors come from huge things. And we believe that this is what we need. But the fewer initiatives you have, the bigger each one needs to be. Because otherwise, how are you going to achieve your growth goals, which is anyway the wrong goal for innovation. And the bigger your, your project is, the higher the cost of failure, which is why the rocket is such a good metaphor in the end, because if that one fails, the cost is really, really high. So what still, corporate innovators want big rockets, fewer, bigger, better rockets. And because the cost of failure is so high, they want to reduce the risk. We want to reduce the risk. And therefore, we have, you know, a very, very long um, due diligence, if you like, um, internal development phases, stage gates, and a validation process. And that really slows us down, you know. So while we're building our three rockets, we're probably overtaken by competition or startups who have found another means of transport. But at least we did everything right, right? At least we can't be blamed for making a costly mistake because we validated and we did all of the due diligence. It took us years, you know, and we went back and back and we did internal testing and we did prediction and we did planning. So if the rocket fails, of course, it's going to do big damage, but at least it's not my fault. That is a thinking that you can recognize when you hear quotes like this. We need a focused innovation portfolio. You know, that's what your new boss says, right? We need a more focused innovation portfolio. Or which are our five big bets or three big bets? Or this one, we really can't afford for this one to go wrong. 
let me just turn my phone away this is not a good idea to call me now when i'm talking to you so um we can't afford for this one to go wrong true for rockets true for corporate innovation and because you can't afford for this one to go wrong you will basically never launch it because you can never be safe and this also happens to a lot of of corporate innovations you know by the time they're finally ready they don't get launched because there is still a risk left so this this is seriously 20th century innovation thinking and we have so much better ways of looking at innovation portfolio management today and again i will share those in the boot camp our fifth stumbling block is that we allow our core operations to kill off innovations if you look at this this pick right you can see why um our core businesses are standardized and optimized for efficiency streamlined right um these boxes these square boxes they are absolutely optimized for how you can best utilize the cargo space of a truck for example if you're still trucking your stuff around the world or on a container ship or whatever so as soon as something turns up that looks not square not cubic you know it just screws up everything this little blue ball here totally screws up the bonus the performance bonus of the person in the company who is in charge and is measured against um, optimal utilization of warehousing and transport space. Because it doesn't really fit in. And there are these little spaces where you have to transport air. So basically, what a healthy core business will do, no matter which industry, is it will isolate, repel, and combat everything that's new and different especially when they are competing for the same pool of resources. They react like a virus, like an organism to a virus. And competing for the same pool of resources, that's almost inevitable. It's inevitable unless you keep innovation completely apart from your core business or your ring fence resources. But, you know, the pool of resources extends way beyond money. It's shelf space or online e-commerce shelf space it's the wallet of you know people who will have to pay for for your new innovation but it's also the promotion budget and the sales force attention and so on and so on and so on so the way we do innovations as something you know it's supposed to be different but you bring it in touch with the core business and the core business will fight back in normally it does that very successfully and the problem is one of the biggest problems is that you only see this when it is too late when your your when your innovation is already in market and your core business is showing those reactions i can explain that more i know it sounds slightly mysterious but it really isn't it's it's very very straightforward um, what you, you can recognize this when you hear sentences like, ah, oh, this is such a distraction to my teams. Or, what's the ROI on this one? What's the ROI on this one means, I'm sure it's lower than the ROI of my core operations. And what percent of the spending that we put behind the innovation is actually paying back into my brand, my existing brand? So those, those types of questions, that type of thinking, which you will hear a lot, is a sure sign that this stumbling block is, is looming very large on the path of your innovation. Stumbling block number six, we think of innovation always as something additional. Uh, let me tell you, I've worked with so many teams, right? And they automatically gravitate towards innovation as an addition to the existing portfolio it doesn't matter what the existing portfolio is right 
uh, it could be consumer goods or it could be tech or it could be cars. Innovation is an addition to the current portfolio because, and this is the logic, right? Um, if we need to deliver growth, you can't take something away or just change something. You need to add something. We know that's not true. Of course, you can also achieve growth by making something existing better. But that's not the way we think. We think something new. Because also, inventing something new is so much more fun. It's so much more fun to make this little crown for the, for the chiclet than to teach the chiclet on the, on the left better manners, right? That will also not be visible. So also, as soon as you, as you regard innovation as making something existing better instead of adding something new, um, the existing chick will protest and say, I'm already good enough. You don't have to teach me manners. You see what I mean? Like improving something existing means admitting that it's not perfect. And we don't like to admit that the existing portfolio is not perfect, especially those people who are in charge of it. And those are not the same people who want to innovate or who need to innovate, who are, you know, in charge of innovating. So we do new things. And the more we add, the more fragmented our portfolio becomes and the smaller the incremental growth so that people that can then go and ask, what is the, how much of your innovation revenue is actually incremental? Well, not much because, you know, I have always have to do something additional and the margins just get smaller and smaller. And while I'm pushing my 15th little fragment of addition to the portfolio into the same virtual or real shelf, that always goes at the expense of the current portfolio. Because again, it's the same pool of resources. So you see how all of these stumbling blocks are connected because we need to, because we think we have to do something additional, the core business has to fight back and it will. You can, I mean, that chick is definitely going to hack the other one's crown off. Innovation does not have to be something additional. It doesn't even have to be a new thing. It could be a new process. It could be a new way of doing existing things. It could be a way of bringing existing things to more new people. It could be doing something different with existing things. But that's not how we think about it, right? And we should, we should. I always recommend the uh, 10 types of innovation, which can be used across industries, um, invented by Dublin. Dublin's 10 types of innovation. Difficult to understand um, based on the, on the uh, material that you can get free in the public space, but it's really worth understanding. And stumbling block number seven. And this is a really weird one. We used the wrong set of KPIs, right? Um, even when I, was, when I was, you know, talking about this boot camp, we were talking about how should we, how should we call it? How should we call the boot camp about why corporate innovation fails and how it could actually be made to work? The uh, I think the original title was how to accelerate growth with innovation, and I said no, we can't use that title because this you know thought that innovation is here to accelerate growth, while it's not wrong that innovation will accelerate growth, it's the wrong KPI to start off with. Revenue, revenue growth, gross margin aggression, ROI, payback, break even, and net present value, in case you don't know, NPV, and cash flow. Those are usually the KPIs that innovation teams get. They have to work against them. And that is not a good idea. Um, I'll tell you why. So, on the one hand, you can't possibly predict, you cannot possibly predict with something that is really new and different at the beginning of the journey, how much revenue it will make in year three. 
you have to bring it to market first and see how it works, right? You can't, you can't sit in a room and write a PowerPoint about the year three revenue of something that doesn't exist yet, something that the customer has not had any experience with yet. So metrics you cannot possibly predict. And because you can't predict revenue, obviously you can't predict ROI or cash flow or anything else. They will also compromise product integrity. Like, okay, this innovation has to be, has to have a higher profit margin than our core business. Why? Because it will take away a little chunk of your core business if it's successful. So if your innovation takes a tiny bite out of your core business, it replaces higher margin with lower margin. And we don't want that. So it has to be margin accredited. Uh, but it cannot possibly be. Why? As we've seen before, your core business is optimized, standardized for maximum efficiency. It has all the benefits of mind-boggling scale. And your little innovation does not have any of that. It hasn't been optimized. It hasn't been streamlined yet. It doesn't even exist yet. And no, it does not have the benefit of scale. So how can it possibly be margin accredited? And not in year 10, but you know, it's supposed to be designed to be that from the start. And my, the worst reason, I mean, the reason why these KPIs are so super wrong is because you probably don't need innovation to achieve those. Again, ROI, if I give you, I don't know, a million dollars, where will you get faster revenues if you put that million dollars into, you know, the core business, let's say uh, distribution expansion or, or price promotion or whatever, like Tesla just did, you know, you will get instant ROI, won't you? Because your core business is already there. It already has a loyal customer base. And if you sell more of that, all of the benefits of scale kick in. So you cannot possibly ever get a better payback, a better ROI in the short term by putting the same amount of money into the development of an innovation that you could get by putting it in the core business, which is why those metrics are wrong. And if people give you those metrics and ask you to do corporate innovation against those metrics, you should refuse because they are not helpful. They compromise your, yeah, the integrity of your innovation. And as soon as, you know, you're ready to launch your rocket, somebody will find out that maybe it's not margin accredited in the first year. So, you know, the core business wants that money and the core business will pay back better, faster. No wonder the core business kills the intruder, right? The only problem is if you follow that short-term logic for sufficient time, you will simply run out of innovation. You will not have innovations. And then that doesn't bode very well for your core, for your core operations either. So those are the seven stumbling blocks. And, you know, I had to kind of, I couldn't dig too deep into them. Each of them is connected to the way that big companies operate. There is a good reason why they operate that way. But it, you need to understand how the intrinsic systemic way that big companies usually operate leads to all of those stumbling blocks. And honestly, seeing them for what they are is already quite good recognizing them when they appear and you can navigate them so you know i believe we can make it work it's not easy but corporate innovation can work we see that all the time a deep understanding of those at least seven stumbling blocks plus what i would suggest are about five mind shifts five key mind shifts that you need to make and a number of design principles. When I say design principles, it's mainly about how to organize for innovation, right? 
um, org design, but also um, the methodologies that you use and so on. Those would be design principles. In my experience, these five mind shifts and seven design principles, why the list may not be totally complete, can get you a very, very long way. And I will dig into more of this in the boot camp, like I said. Uh, I'll do a recap of those seven stumbling blo blocks for corporate innovation, the ones that we just covered and um, where they come from. Um, I will dig into the five mind shifts and the seven design principles. But for today, I think I've already uh, talked longer than Ahan said I should. Yeah, almost exactly 30 minutes. So um, there will be uh, time for questions and answers. If you have questions in the chat, I have not seen them so far because uh, obviously all I see is my screen and the, the presentation I do. But it is now Q&A time and I will stop screen sharing and go back to Ermit. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Ingeborg. This has been super helpful. Um, we have some questions coming in, so we'll definitely use that as an opportunity uh, to bring it up. But I guess in the meantime, before we just do that, a couple of housekeeping. So I sent out the link to everyone. If you guys want to learn more about Ingeborg's bootcamp, I threw out the link in there. Uh, you know, do check it out and uh, join the wait list. Um, but, and also if you found Ingeborg's presentation valuable or helpful, please uh, express it in the emojis. Uh, all right, Ingeborg, thank you so much. That was super helpful. I'm going to start doing questions uh, and I'm going to bring it up on stage so you should be able to see it. Uh, Nitin's asking, what are the constraints on your problem statement that can detect uh, and correct what you have so far? It's phrased a little bit weirdly, but yeah, I, I don't really started. understand the question. I'm sorry. Yeah, maybe. Hey, let's try this. I'm not try this. Hey, Nitin, are you still? I'm gonna invite you to the stage and see if it works. Um, but I think constraints on my problem statement. Yeah. Hey, Nitin, you there? Yeah, I'm. 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 I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can. So do you want to clarify your question, please? Oh uh, yes, it might it might have been phrased a little weird. I, I meant like if if you have a problem statement that you crafted, how do you, how do you make it better? Like, what are you looking for to say that you've nailed the problem statement? Mm. Well, uh, it has to be crystal clear uh, to everyone that you share it with. Like, throw it around, right? Um, it has to be for innovation, right? You mean you mean for innovation? Yeah, for innovation. Yeah, for innovation, exactly. Um, it, it has to be super clear. And you know what? It has to be created in the real world. Because what I see people do, and I include startups here, um, they make up problem statements. Because they would love that problem to exist so they can apply their solution to it. So... Uh, a really good problem statement has to be tested in the real world. A couple of other things. It has to be single-minded. That's why I mean by razor sharp, right? Not blah, 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 blah with, um, you know, loads of words. It should be razor sharp and, and, and focused. And it should engage with those people who own the problem. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Thanks, Nitin. This is the first time we've tried this feature, and I think it worked out pretty cool. Uh, all right. Let me. Let, we got some more questions coming up. So here, let's do this. Yeah, I saw a couple. Yeah. So yeah, folks, please use the Q and A button because it allows me to this, do this feature where I can throw the question up and then I can bring you up if I don't understand it. All right, and I'm going after the ones that are the most popular. So if you find another question that's oh, good, just upload it. So Bongani from Joburg, South Africa is asking, how does a risk averse culture within a company impact innovation? What steps can businesses take to foster a culture that embraces risk taking and experimentation? This is a big question. Big <laughs> question. Like yeah, it's a great oh, question. No, 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 no. It's, it's a very, very good one. So listen, we like to bash big companies and corporations, right, for being risk averse. 
But don't forget, they have a lot to lose. It's easy to take risk when you have nothing to lose. They have a hundred years of uh, history. They have tens of thousands of jobs that they have created and they have billions of revenue, right? So obviously, and, and since, especially, especially if they are listed companies, not privately owned companies, right? They are actually working with other people's money. So wouldn't you rather for them to be slightly risk averse? So this, I've, in fact, this is one of the biggest misunderstandings about risk and failure that I would love to clarify right here and now. It's not about lo loving to take risk. I don't think that big corporates should learn to love taking big risks. There is a myth, right, that says that, yeah, we need, we need to become more risk friendly and less risk averse and so on and so on. But think of the rocket. The reason why we are risk averse is because we construct innovation to have a huge cost of failure. And I do this, I mean, in real life, this is not a theory, right? I'm, I, I work with companies and, and I try to help them understand that it's not about risk, it's about cost of failure. If you can construct your toolbox, your innovation toolbox to lower the cost of failure of each individual innovation project, you will see how, you know, people are all of a sudden more willing to take risks. Because if it fails, nothing bad happens. So that's why, and I'll talk about this in the boot camp, instead of building three rockets, we have to build 20 small things at the same time, or even more than 20, right? And each of them with minimal cost of failure. And then we are also willing to take risks. Or never isolate risk, the likelihood of, of failure from the cost of failure. Those are, you can't separate them. Awesome, that was a great response. Uh, appreciate you going in depth there. I'm just gonna keep moving on because we have about like five, six that have come in. So I'm gonna try to do another two or three. Um, all right, so Mikhail from Edmonton is asking, will you recommend companies create a separate business unit that only focus on innovation, just like how they have CVC? I don't know mm. what CVC is. Corporate uh, you... Ah, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so I guess maybe also re reflect on your years of experience at Kraft and one of the ways, like how did you guys tackle innovation? Was it a separate legal entity? Was it an internal thing? I've, I know a lot of people have asked me personally on this and I, like I thought, it's always it depends, but yeah, I'd love to get your two cents on this. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I mean, this is what I've done, right? The, the, take a decision about exactly those, those uh, questions. There are different types of innovation. Some innovations are better at home in the core operations. And those are obviously not the breakout innovations. Those are the, the incremental innovations. If you want to do something really new and different, yes, indeed, and you should do many of those. Yes, indeed, you need to separate them from the core business. You need to separate them from the core operations. And look, You've seen a lot of things uh, that during, you know, in, in, in the seven stumbling blocks, a lot of things that need to be true for innovation to succeed. You need different KPIs. You need different goals, very different goals. Uh, you need diff a different toolbox. You need um, to separate them from efficiency, standardization, streamlining and scale while they grow. So do you need a legal entity for that? I, I definitely recommend it, and my recommendation was accepted, to build a new organizational unit. Legal entity, I don't know that's, if that's you know, the most important question, but uh, an organizational unit separate enough to have its own set of KPIs, its own decision structures, its own methodologies, its own policies, because policies can also kill innovation. It's maybe stumbling block number 11 or something. <laughs> that, that, <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> I like that. 
Hey, dude. Ooh, I'm, I'm learning so much from this. I appreciate you going into so, so much. I've done a lot of these interviews. I think the way you answer the questions are, are very well uh, because it goes into a lot of details. So I do appreciate you going into that level of detail. Sure. Uh, this is a fun question from Paolo. What in innovation books do you recommend? I'm sure you have your own personal library, but anything that comes to mind? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think I mentioned two of them in the, in the slides. Yeah, one of them is The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. Um, one is uh, Growing the Core by Baron Sharp, which is basic, basically anti-innovation. I would totally uh, read The Lean Startup. Um, and there was one other that I always recommend, which I can't remember right now. Oh, yeah, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, yeah, the, yeah. yeah. Then on the right. Great book, yeah. Daniel Kahneman, behavioral economist, got the Nobel Prize for finding out, guys, for finding out and proving that you cannot ask people what they are going to do. And this whole thing about rockets and how you have to internally validate them and how you have to do due diligence for three years before you can launch the rocket rests on the assumption that human beings can tell you what they will do once your product is in the market, but they cannot. And that's what Daniel Kahneman proved. So it's a really good um, myth buster. It, you know, it, it will destroy quite a few of the beliefs that you've had. That's why it's such an important thing to read. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I, I want to do one more question, Ing Ingeborg, and then we'll jump into some networking for the last 10 minutes. Whoever is available, please, I'll, I'll jump on to, for, to some tables. I know there's a lot of questions here, guys. Uh, like, I just want to be conscious of everyone's time. Um, Shamir is asking this. I feel like you kind of answered it. If, if you did, then we can do another one. But it's like bringing outside innovation into, into the teams. What is DT? I do not know. Sure. Here, let's invite. Shamir, I'm going to invite you to stage, and then maybe you can clarify this. Let's see. DT. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, but this is about bringing innovation into the whole organization instead of just uh, limiting it to an innovation team. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. My approach would be a razor sharp problem statement because everybody can relate to the problem, hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. So you would not, uh, let me just close the window because a plane is overhead. Just a second. Your manufacturing company should not ask the blue collar workers, what are your innovative ideas? Like share your innovation ideas with us. Like that crowdsourcing ideas stuff that some companies do just to feel better about themselves really, or hope that employees feel better. That's not great. But what I've seen play out beautifully is if you, if you, send a problem statement into the organization. Like, what are your ideas to make X and Y more sustainable? What are your ideas to save warehousing space? Uh, you know, any, any ideas on how we can make our customer response time 50% um, faster? And you will see how stuff pours in. Clear problem statements will get you more results. And then, yes, of course, the best ones you'll have to implement. You can't do this as a fig leaf. You can't do this as a culture thing. If you ask them to come up with ideas, you have to want them also. That's awesome. I feel like a lot of things you say should be like posters in people's offices and just <laughs> with a firm. Uh, uh, they should be, absolutely. Yes, good idea. Yeah, this is, uh, this would be, yeah, so you're getting a lot of thumbs up. I think we should sell posters at Ingeborg. Uh, Albert and Growth, you can you <laughs> you you can uh, be the the face of it. Cool. I think, guys, this is a good time to end things. Uh, Ingeborg, thank you so much. I think this has been very educational, and helpful. I'm going to share the link to everyone for the boot camp uh, again. You know, if you if you've enjoyed this, please consider joining the waitlist. We're going to be releasing more information on that shortly. Uh, but you know, the whole idea is to bring more of this content and more more things like Ingeborg's talking about for individuals like you. 
Uh, Ingeborg, any final words for uh, anyone before we break out for networking? Just so you know, we had close to, we have 73 people now live, but we had close to, let me just double check the numbers. We had, we had 235 people sign up, out of which 128 people joined at one point. So this wow. is a very high attendance rate. So uh, a lot of people came to hear you speak. So any final words for anyone in the audience that's in corporate innovation, considering corporate innovation or, or, or whichever? Yeah. yeah. Don't listen to people who say they have the solution and want you to pay for it because there isn't one solution. Um, there's a couple of things you have to do and it depends a bit on what your company is and, and what industry you're in. So there is, there is not just that silver bullet. It's hard work. Perfect. I love it. I'm, I'm seeing some questions there on the recording. Yes, the recording will be available. We'll try to get out in the next 24, but we usually say 48 hours. And um, we, we'll, we'll send it out to everyone so they can uh, review it um, because I'm sure like Ingeborg dropped a lot of great knowledge so you guys can constantly review it as well. Uh, all right, we'll wrap up there. Uh, once, uh, once again, Ingeborg, thank you so much. I'm going to see you all on the networking tables. Uh, you know, Ingeborg, if you have a few minutes, feel free to stick around. If not, that's totally okay as well. Uh, all right, guys. In, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Uh, thank you so much for joining in and uh, we'll see you shortly. Thanks. Bye.